I spent a lot of mornings, 7 and 8 o'clock in the morning before school or during the summer at my family's kitchen table drinking coffee while my grandfather chain-smoked and told me all kinds of stories about his escapades and different points in his life. And one of my favorite stories came from World War II. The other thing that I used to do with my grandfather besides listen to his stories was we used to stay up at 11 or 12 o'clock at night and watch all kinds of classic movies. And so from a very early age, I could tell you about Barbara Stanwyck and Humphrey Bogart and Earl Flynn. And when my grandfather would tell me these stories, especially the ones from the 1940s, I saw everything in black and white. And my grandfather was a really handsome guy. And so when he would tell these stories, I'd see him as a young man, um, sort of Cary Grantish, being amazing. And everything was everything in my mind had theme music. And my, one of my favorite stories from his war stories came from after um, the end of the war. And he was, apparently the war ends in May. And all of the soldiers, it takes about six months for all of them to be shipped back to the United States, which you probably won't know unless you're a historian or had a granddad who was in World War II. And so there was nothing to do for a while, but um, there was decimation everywhere. And he happened to be walking through this town that had been destroyed, and there had just been this horrible bombing, and there was cleanup going on. And he and his friends were taking a walk, and he hears from some place, help, help, and it's a woman's voice. And they're trying to figure out where it is. And no one's around. And he finally figures out this woman is calling from a basement. And so he goes and he and his friends remove all this rubble and they find the door to the basement. And, they, and this is where the theme music for me kicks in for the 1940s. And the door, and there's my grandfather looking all Cary Grantish. And he opens the door and the sun streams down into this basement where this poor woman has been hiding for about a week. And she's, of course, gorgeous. I don't know in actu- like if she actually was a beautiful woman, but in my mind, she might as well be Marlena Dietrich, right? Because this is my grandfather's war story. And there's this shaft of light, and my handsome grandfather with his broad shoulders comes down, and this woman is disabled. And she turns to my grandfather, and she says, I want to see the sun. So my grandfather, hero music, goes, picks her up, carries her out up the stairs and brings her and sets her down under a tree and goes off with his amazing war hero friends on to the next adventure. And so my grandfather tells me this story and he's drinking his coffee and smoking a cigarette and after he finishes, there's this pause. And I'm about eight. And I go, what happened to the lady? And my grandfather goes, like he left the water on or something. (laughs) Like there was an iron on, but it had been on for like 45 years and he forgot to go turn it on. You know that feeling you have when you leave the house and you left the lights on? That was the look on his face. So we told the story of Thanksgiving for about 20 years after that because it was so funny that he really had never thought of what happened to that lady after they kept walking until that moment in like 1982. And the other thing I found funny about this story is that my grandfather was never caught off guard. And that was his M.O. My grandfather made sure that I and all of our neighbors and everybody in the family knew that he was the best put together, most competent person on the planet Earth. And he could prove it to you because he grew up in the slums. This is the old story, right? He grew up in the slums of Brooklyn. And he went and he was the first one in his family to get a house in the suburbs with two cars and take his wife on trips to Las Vegas. And he could take apart a car and put it back together. And when something was broken, a neighbor had something broken at their house, they'd always call Billy and Billy would come to fix it. And that was how he was known. He had no incompetencies. He had no areas where he needed help. And so when I was getting ready for college, he did his best to make sure that when I went out into the world, I learned the most important thing was to be independent and be able to take care of yourself and not be incompetent. Be able to go out there and do things, which I am very grateful for. And he, I remember one thing, 
um, before I left, he showed me how to change the tires on my car. On my, it was about a 20-pound Ford Escort. It was made out of tin foil. And he showed me how to take the tires and put them back on and off. And he took the donut out of the car because that was a piece of junk, right? And he got a real tire and stuck it in there. We played with putting the tires back on, taking them on and putting them off. Until one day, when I was a sophomore, um, my car got a flat on the New York Turnpike, or in the New Jersey Turnpike on the way home. And I pulled over and I was ready to roll because I could ba you could basically pick this car up, take the tire off and put it on without using a jack. And I got out and I was about to go fix my tire and one after another, here I am like a 19 year old young woman, right? One after another, one guy pulls up and says, do you need help with your tire? And I'm like, no, no thanks, I got it. And they look confused and they keep going. And then when I'm in the middle of it, another person comes up, hey, you need help with your tire? And I'm getting angry at this point. It's just like, don't you know that I do not need anybody's help? Right? And I was furious because I, how dare you think I need help or offer me help? And I, too, have this in my head, this Bill McGregor-ness that tells me the most important thing is to make sure that you never need any help and that your insecurities or your failures are always tucked in. Here's the problem. As a priest, which I've been for a while now, I have found that becoming a good priest has to do with unlearning that lesson and doing everything you can to allow people to see where your needs are and your failures are and allow them to not only see them, but to help you. Because the whole point of being a church is, in fact, to need one another and to share in seeing each other's wounds and to see how, you know, my insecurities and my failures and the things I'm not good at will be there for each other to take care of each other and lift each other up. So my life is a priest. And it's funny because it's just this instinct. I have my Bill McGregor in the back of my head. You say, do you want, to, do you want me to help you bring that out to my car? My grandfather is yelling in the back of my head, no, you don't want them to help you bring that out to your car. And I have to say, uh, yes, I do. I do want you to help me bring that out to my car. Or, listen, Lori, do you need somebody to pray with you? Are you having a bad day? And I, my grandfather's like, no, you do not. And I'm like, oh, yes, I need you to pray with me because I'm having a bad day, you know, over and over again. And if somebody says, Lori, you have guacamole on front of your alb from the 9 o'clock service. Do you want me to get a wet paper towel and help you get rid of that? Instead of saying, no, it's a fashion statement. I like guacamole on my alb, right? I have to say, oh my gosh, I missed my mouth again. Because I had to, you know, I'm, could you please go get a wet paper towel and fix my guacamole stain? That's what it is. That's my life as a priest. And it's also standing up and preaching about that. That's my job. That's also the job that the Gospels present to the disciples every time this feeding of the 5,000 comes up. By the way, the feeding of the 5,000 is the only miracle that makes an appearance in all four Gospels. And not only does it appear four times, it appears six times. So apparently, if there's anything that the New Testament wants us to remember about Jesus, it is this story. This is the big one. It is the story to end all miracle stories. In John's version of it, Jesus is sitting up on a mountain with his apostles. And all of a sudden, while he is preaching to them, it happens to be the Passover... And by the way, if you don't know much about Passover, you probably know two things. Passover has to do with leading the people into freedom, 
And it also has to do with that time when Jesus was, or not Jesus, when Moses was there and the people didn't have enough to eat and God kept making bread and bread and bread during that time in the wilderness. So people, it's Passover, we're already thinking about men in the wilderness and we're thinking about Moses and here Jesus just happens to be sitting on a mountain like somebody else named Moses. And he's with his apostles. And all these people start flooding towards them because they know that Jesus has been healing people. And in John's version of this story, Jesus uses this as a teaching moment. And he turns to Philip and says to Philip in faux despair, Philip, all these people, no food, they're hungry. What are we going to do? And Philip falls for it. He looks and all he sees is people and nothing and hopelessness and a dead end. And he turns to Jesus and he's like, man, we're going to fall on our faces. Oh, this is bad. And then Jesus then turns over to see what Andrew's got cooking. And Andrew's thinking about it. And he thinks, I just saw a kid with five loaves of bread and two fish. And I think in the face of having 5,000 people, it's like Andrew saying, Dude, I think I got a couple of granola bars in the bottom of my knapsack, right? You can just hear the apostles just going, Oh my God, you're so stupid. (laughs) Nevertheless, Jesus says, Bring me the fish and bring me the bread. And tell the people to sit down. And then in John's Gospel, it doesn't always happen this way in all of the tellings of this story. In John's Gospel, Jesus takes the bread, and Jesus takes the fish, and Jesus himself goes and feeds everybody. It has nothing to do with the apostles. You can read this story however you want, and I've read it 20 different times probably in the last 24 hours. But the one thing I hear over and over again when I hear this story, is that you and I come to church to confess that we do not have enough and that we are not enough. And we take all of those things that we've done that we wish we hadn't done and those things that we've left undone and our inability to face tomorrow and fix the news and figure out what's wrong with the world and be part of fixing it when we feel overwhelmed with our humanness and our failedness and our inability to fix things. We take all of that and we say, Jesus, I can't do it, but here's my heart. Here are my hands. Here's my three bean casserole. Here's my Tuesday morning. I'm giving it to you. And you'll bless it, and I trust that you're going to make it part of heaven. Show me the kingdom of heaven when I give it to you. This doesn't work on your own, by the way. So if you think you're going to go home and try this by yourself, this is not something to try it yourself by yourself at home. It, you'll fall on your face. Because Jesus doesn't do this for an individual. Jesus does this for the church. That group of people that follow him and don't understand him at all and are always confused and never have enough. But they just love him. They don't know why, but there's this tug inside of them that says that they belong to him. They're the church. None of them are particularly smart. They don't even necessarily have marketable skills. And they have proven over and over again in the Gospels by the, that they are totally incompetent. But they love him. And they know somebody who has five loaves and two fish. And they'll be there. And brothers and sisters, when the church comes together and shares their brokenness and their lack, their lacking, and just offers it up to God and loves and love one another and love God, amazing things happen. I see it all the time. It's so common at Grace Church, it's hard to even remember the last time it happened. I can remember about six months ago when it happened. How about this? When I was hired at this church... It's not in my contract. Not only, I'm not complaining anybody who was here for that. Not only 
because I knew. Am I the rector and I'm responsible for the church? Oh, by the way, you're also the director of Grace Community Services, a not-for-profit organization that operates 700, I mean, seven days a week and serves hundreds of people every week. But, you know, that's not even in there. Well, you'll figure that out when you get here. Also, you have a family life, supposedly, and two teenage children and lots of laundry, so you go figure that out. I knew that when I got here. So that's meant a few things. One is that um, there are some things that don't get done, such as, let's talk about pastoral care. I promise you, and I have been true to this promise, if you're in the hospital or in jail, I will bring you communion or I will pay you a visit. Outside of that, if you're mildly depressed or your grandmother is terminally ill, I'm probably not going to know. And this has been an issue. And I felt kind of flat, flat on my face vulnerable about this because a pastor is supposed to be pastor role and know what's going on in the congregation. And I felt kind of horrible about it. So one Sunday morning at 9 o'clock, I'm not kidding you for people who weren't here for that, a guy in a monk suit <laughs> with his husband shows up. It was raining. And this guy, you're not going to believe this, he has a monk raincoat. <laughs> and he came in his monk raincoat and sat down with his husband. And then asked if I wanted to go to lunch and told me that there's a difference between monks and friars. And I'm like, really? I had no idea. I know about fire tuck from Robin Hood. And he told me about, yeah, the Episcopal Church has friars, and I'm a friar. What's your job, John Henry? My job is supposed to be to go and serve the neighborhood and to um, witness to the love of Christ. And I really like the church, so I'm thinking of coming and setting up shop. Can I hang my monk outfit in the sacristy? And I'm like, yeah, okay. You just met Dean at the front door, his husband greeting you, if you don't know. And uh, six months later, how many people are on the pastoral care team? I'd say maybe about 12. 12 people on the pastoral care team. And I still pretty much have it nailed if you're in jail or in the hospital. Like, you'll see me. But every week, every week, I get this text. And it tells me things like, Francine's brother-in-law is going through surgery for, you know, for his heart condition. Pray for him. And remember this one's grandmother. And this person is going through a difficult divorce. Pray for this person. And I can sit there with my text and pray. <laughs> and every once in a while, I'll turn to John Henry and I'll say, do you want me to come to the next meeting? And Julie, what do, what do people say at the pastoral care meeting? No. No, you don't need to come. They don't even want me. <laughs> I am so happy. <laughs> I'm so used to stuff like that happening in church. It, you, I, I, it's hard for me to identify. But there's miracles and loaves and fishes like that all the time around here. All the time. It's the way that Jesus works. Jesus turns to me and says, Lori, there are all these pastoral care needs, and there's only one you. What are we going to do? And I go, I don't know, Jesus. I think the church is going to close, and I'm a failure. <laughs> Jesus rolls his eyes and says, Give them to me. And in walks John Henry. If you want to see a miracle, hang out for six months. It's a guarantee. Amen. Amen.